It's great to be with you again this evening. You know, sexual impurity has become a major downfall in American society today. It also, it doesn't just affect really the young people, but it also affects even the older people. Fifty years ago, divorce was just almost unheard of, and people were ashamed when they had to go through a divorce because of marital infidelity. I remember as a young man when I was in high school, one of my friend's parents wound up getting a divorce because his daddy cheated on his mama. And it was almost unheard of in our town, especially among the older generation. But you know, with the influence of Hollywood promoting sexuality as something that is to be desired and to be elevated, morality has hit an all-time low in America. Sexual immorality affects more than just the two that are having that affair. It also affects their families and the friends that are associated with them. In his book, The Best Question Ever, Andy Stanley said this, Nothing has stolen more dreams, dashed more hopes, broken up more families, and messed up more people psychologically than our propensity to disregard God's commands regarding sexual purity. Most of the major social ills in America are caused by or fueled by the misuse of our sexuality. If issues related to sexual impurity, adultery, the shrapnel associated with adultery, addiction to pornography, AIDS, and other sexually transmitted diseases, abortion, and the psychological effects associated with abortion, sexual abuse, incest, rape, and all other sexual addictions, addictions were suddenly disappear from society, imagine the resources we would have available to apply to the handful of issues that would remain. So pretty much what he's saying is a whole lot of our problems in America stems from sexual impurity. So how do we eradicate this sexual immorality among us? Do we try to take the pleasure away from sexuality? Well, the answer to that, of course, is no. Because God is the one who actually created the pleasure in sexuality, but he commanded it to be experienced only in marriage. Hebrews 13 verse 4 says it very plainly, Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So according to God, marriage is the only place where sex is allowed. And if we tried to remove the joy of sex, it would change the world all right. But it would also change God's plan for intimacy and in marriage. So it's not about removing the joy, but actually controlling our desires and fashioning them according to God's plan. Now there's no doubt that we live in a sex-crazed society today because you can find it on every corner. Go to the internet, <clears throat> it's all over the internet, all over TV. It's in our schools, it's on the playgrounds, it's at the lake, you name it, it's there. Places where you think you might be safe from it, guess what, you're gonna find it. You can't get away from it. So what we have to do is we have to practice self-control over our minds and over our bodies. As Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7, God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. So let's see what we need to know about sexuality as God designed it, and let's strive to be pure in his sight. <clears throat> now the Bible, of course, is God's instruction to mankind on how to live holy lives and be able to inherit eternal life. And when man submits to the correct standard of God's, man, God's word, then he possesses a system of moral conduct. And when we possess that system of moral conduct, then we live like he wants us to live and not the way we want to live. Now there are several perversions of man concerning sexuality that the Bible warns us about. And one of the great moral dangers that's affecting the home today is called pornography. Pornography is the noun form which means written or other forms of communication intended to incite lust. Prost the Greek word porne, from which we get our word pornography, means harlot or prostitute. And prostitution of all kinds is clearly condemned all throughout the scriptures. We see it in the Old Testament, Luke 9, or, I'm sorry, Leviticus 19.29, and then also in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. 
because it only brings further sin and problems in people's lives. So God condemns it. It is nothing but moral filth, and worldly people are the ones who set the standard. Now, pornography is a big promoter of all kinds of illicit sex. The Bible warns us concerning the use of our bodies in fornication and adultery. In fact, Paul said in Ephesians 5, 3, that fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. We are not to become one with the harlot, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 13 through 18. Sexual relationships are only right in marriage. In fact, under the old law, those who were caught in adultery, they were to be stoned to death, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. But you know, the Bible also condemns something else called incest. We are not to uncover our parents or our children's nakedness for evil, Leviticus chapter 20, verses 11 and 12. And also pornography even promotes things like bestiality. That's having sex with animals. Another thing that would condemn someone to death under the old law, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 15. But here's something else. Immodest apparel would also fall into the category of sexuality. After all, the only purpose I see for someone showing off their sexuality is for advertisement purposes. If you're trying to do that through immodest apparel, uh, I don't see any reason for wearing things like this except for advertising. And young people, when you entice the opposite sex enough, eventually you're going to succumb to their desires to do more than just see the advertising. And that's something you have to be careful with. Both men and women are commanded by inspiration to adorn themselves in modest apparel, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And there is no double standard here. In fact, in 1 Peter 3 and 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, these are written especially to the women because of the weakness of man. But we all know what is modest and we all know what is immodest. And anyone who desires to have a godly heart and they are living for heaven, they will seek to dress modestly. We are to adorn ourselves with godliness, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. We are not to follow the fashion of the world, especially if it demands bearing our sexuality. Fashion does not dictate the Christian. The Bible does. And according to the Bible, even exposing the thigh is considered as nakedness. And it's not just for the women, it's also for the men. We see the priest in Exodus chapter 28, verse 42, restricted for uncovering their thigh. We see it for women in Isaiah chapter 47, verses 2 and 3. So short shorts, I don't care whether you're good looking or not good looking, you are still exposing your nakedness and it should not be known among Christians. So don't wear them out in public. Now, most of you parents know what causes lust. And therefore, we have a special responsibility in training our children to be modest in their appearance. Are we teaching our children, our daughters, our young men to be chaste? C-H-A-S-T-E. In other words, being pure and virtuous and godly. Are we training our young women to be chaste? C-H-A-S-E-D. Don't let ego and vanity cause you to disregard God's law. The sin of homosexuality, it is gaining more and more ground in American society today. But this is something that goes back to the early history of mankind. Some today say that homosexuality is nothing more than just an alternate lifestyle. And it's our choice whether we want to indulge in it or not, and you don't have the right to point fingers. People are saying that all the time today. But the Bible teaches that those who do God's commandments are the only ones who have the right to the tree of life, Revelation 22, verse 14. And when God condemns something, man does not have the right to claim it as an alternate lifestyle. In the Old Testament, God decreed death for those who practiced homosexuality. Listen to what God said in Leviticus 18, verse 22. 
Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. In Leviticus 20, verse 13, it further says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And remember, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, Romans chapter 15, verse 4. But even in the New Testament, we see that God, we were taught that God gave up into vile affections both men and women who were involved in homosexuality. It says there in Romans chapter 1, women changing the natural use into that which is against nature, and men leaving the natural use of the woman and burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. Three times in, in the Romans chapter 1, we see that God gave them up to vile affections. We see it in verses 21 through 24, verses 26 through 29, and verse 32. Homosexuality is a perversion of a grievous fashion in God's eyes. And it is rebellion against God's will, and it will bring men and women subject unto God's wrath, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. So those who practice it and those who support it, they are going to be condemned by God. Now these are all man's perversions. But we also have to understand that man does have obligations toward their sexuality. Now, of course, some find themselves bewildered in this area of sexual purity. In fact, they'll be asking questions like, how do I strengthen my mind to avoid this sexual impurity? Am I hopelessly lost because I can't seem to gain control? Well, friends, there are some answers to these questions that if we follow these answers, then we can glorify God and it will make you a happier person. But the question is, are you really willing to go and do what it takes to make heaven your home? If you really want peace, if you really desire heaven, we need to remember some principles. First of all, we have to know God's word. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. To maintain holiness in the realm of sexuality, we have to do as Paul said, Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on the things of this earth. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. So God has given us instructions concerning sexual purity, but we have to know God's word to know what he said. And we have to be committed to following it cheerfully before we can ever obtain that goal. But second, we don't know, have, just have to know what God said, but we also have to know the why of the restrictions. Now, we can easily perceive the dangers when you separate holiness from sexuality. Immorality of any kind is going to bring physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual misery to both individuals and nations. Such behavior, it destroys so much and it offers so little. When we adhere to immoral behavior, purity is lost. Body and mind are devastated, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 through 20. God's design for the home is destroyed, Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. And our soul will be lost because we have indulged in the works of the flesh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Such behavior has nothing but a negative impact upon our lives. And the Bible makes that very plain. But violation of divine truth also destroys God's divine instructions on the home, the church, and the government. Remember, we are not islands unto ourselves. But anytime we sin in any way, others are going to be affected, both near and remote. Sexual immorality is not a sole act just between two people, but rather it affects an entire population of people. Now third, if we desire heaven, we need to consider holiness and sexuality from God's point of view. God designed us to be attracted to one another, but we have to behave according to his commandments. We are physically attracted to the opposite sex, for the sake of propagation, so that the human race 
might continue. But God specifically reserves such behavior in the marriage contract, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, and not outside of the marriage. And any time we violate God's word in any way, then we cannot expect heaven to be our home unless we repent and we seek the forgiveness of God. Now, sexual impurity in any form, of course, undermines the possibility of true joy in God's arrangements. And therefore, that's why Paul gives warning there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. He says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So to help us to stay on the road to heaven, we have to commit ourselves to viewing our bodies and our behavior from heaven's perspective. We need to learn to do it God's way. Fourth, to have a better chance of heaven being our home, we need to be associating with friends that will wholeheartedly follow God's will. The wise man Solomon said in Proverbs 27, verse 17, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, that evil companionships corrupt good morals. We all know the road of heaven is not an easy road. In fact, Jesus describes it as very narrow and constricted there in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. He tells us that we are to strive to enter into that straight gate, Luke chapter 13, verse 24. So that means it's going to take a lot of effort on our part to get into heaven. It's not going to be something that's just given to us. And therefore, we're going to need all the help that we can get. And we need those who are closest to us to be those who will stand for and they will support the right decisions. We need friends who will help us going to heaven rather than hindering us going to heaven. And then fifth, to have heaven as our home, we must prevent as well as overcome temptations. We always have to prepare ourselves before a situation actually arises that may challenge us to compromise God's directives. If one of your friends is constantly trying to get you to do something to compromise your faith, and they insist on continuing to do that, it is time to find a new friend, because they're not friends at all. If you're tempted to view unrighteous websites on the internet when you're alone, then you need to plan to refrain from those situations. In preaching school, we were told that as preachers, we are not to go and counsel or study with women by themselves, by ourselves, so that both of us are protected from, you know, doing something wrong, either one of us, or being accused of being, doing such. In defensive driving, we were taught to always read the road ahead. And in Christianity, we have to be doing the same thing in order to prevent some very embarrassing or serious situations. If we desire to be free from any sense of sexual immorality, then we have to determine now and we have to keep being determined to uphold God's word at all times. Now, the composition of our human nature includes the sexual element. <clears throat> this is a vital part of God's creative act in humanity. But to keep this from turning into a source of misery or disappointment or heartache, it's necessary that we know how to possess our own vessels. We have to be in control of our own bodies. And God has given us ample instructions and ample warnings about this subject so that when we do commit these things, we are without excuse. Now, if you are one who's already engaged in some type of sexual immorality, let me tell you, all is not lost. There's still hope yet. In fact, if you're willing to make a change, God's willing to forgive. Remember many of the Corinthians, they had been guilty of sexual immorality. We see a list of them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Some were involved in fornication, some in adultery, some were guilty of homosexuality. But Paul said there in verse 11, and says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 
we had the same hope that they did if we would just repent of our sins and turn back to God and seek the forgiveness that we need. You know, the living of life is a very serious matter. In fact, it is an eternal matter. So let's be reminded that life is short, death is certain, and eternity is very, very long. So let's make sure that we have a plan, a purpose, and a path to follow so that we can glorify God and we can keep ourselves free from sexual immorality of any kind. Now that plan and that purpose and that path, they are all provided for us by God through Jesus Christ. Remember in John uh, chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yes, thanks be to God for Jesus Christ that we have a way now, but we have to follow his way. And if we truly do love him, we will keep his commandments. What about you this evening? Is there a sin in your life? If there is and you've never given yourself to Jesus Christ before, you have that opportunity this evening. All you have to do is to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to believe in him as the Son of God. John 8, verse 24, John 3, verse 16. You must confess him before men with your mouth. Matthew 10, 32, Romans 10, verse 10. You must repent of your sins, Luke 13, verse 3, Acts 17, verse 30. And you must be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38. To have your sins washed away, Acts 22, verse 16. And in order to have salvation, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. And once you obey that gospel, God is faithful. And he will add you to his church, the body of the saved. <clears throat> but you have to obey his gospel. And Jesus gives that tender invitation there in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus Christ is inviting you to come to him. He will give you rest from all the immoralities of this world. If there's anything that we can help you with, whatever it is, let us help you. Won't you come while together we stand and sing?